Welcome to the Gong Show. <laughs> some of you are old enough to know that reference. Some of you are not, but uh, uh, actually, I work as a part of a of a five person team managing the uh, international opportunities portfolio. One of my well, actually, two of my primary partners are here today, and you'll you'll you know, you've heard Brad, and he's obviously a key member, and also Mark Painter works with me on the portfolio. And, what we're going to do today is we're going to split this this uh, introduction to what we do in international markets. I'm going to first talk about really the big picture, uh, why we really think there are some wonderful opportunities in equity markets outside of the U.S. and other developed markets, and why really any diversified portfolio really needs to have exposure to the best companies in these markets. Now, again, I'm not saying you need exposure to emerging markets because I think that's a big problem. I think investors who have had the misfortune of investing in, uh, in big, uh, big mutual funds uh, or ETFs in emerging markets over the last five years, they, may have, they might have actually lost money. And certainly they've lost money over the last two years. So you don't invest in emerging market concept. You, you, the idea is that the emerging markets, because of their growth rates and because of the population dynamics, they offer tremendous opportunities for smart, focused managements. And as Bill mentioned, um, I was actually pretty happy um, sitting at home. That, it's my second wife, so you know, I, I should tell you that. And, uh, I had basically been away, out of the, you know, during my older son's, you know, his, his youth, kind of traveling the world, although he did live with me, you know, he lived in Hong Kong for a while with me, but when I came back to the U.S. and was working for Ardsley Partners in New York, you know, I traveled so much, I kind of missed a good part of his, his, his childhood, and I really thought it made some sense to, to spend more time with my the second family, but after really meeting and, and working with Mark and Brad and really understanding what this model could do, yeah, it was really exciting enough for me to, to uh, you know, put on a suit occasionally and, and work again. And what I really like about it is in my 25 years investing in emerging markets, you know, the, 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 what I really learned is that, hey, it's wonderful when these markets are running and, and I think over time, if you're patient, you will make money in, in emerging markets, even investing in an ETF. But you will only get superior returns if you can somehow figure out how to not lose a lot of money when these markets head south. And I promise you they will. And what I saw in the power of, of really, as simple as, as Charlie Munger said, don't be afraid of buying the best companies because over the over any term, superior returns can only be achieved by owning superior companies. And don't fool yourself that you're that trading or buying at a discount. There are some people that can do that. I mean, look at Brad, Mark, and I. We know that there are a lot of different ways to make money, but the key is to be disciplined at whatever you do. And I think our approach in really looking at great companies that, and again, anybody can tell you, they all, you know, everybody only invests in great companies. And it's just that some of them aren't so great now, but they promise to be great tomorrow. But we're, by using this metric so that you see on this really 600 sale model and the focus on what, have they, what has this management actually done throughout market cycles? We look at them through good and bad economic conditions. And, and so, you know, you don't see us playing a lot of pure new IPOs, and you don't see us trying to buy kind of fallen angels. You really see us buying companies that have really long outstanding records where they, over a long period of time, have out-earned their cost of capital by multiples. Um, now, my partner in this is Mark Painter. I'm going to talk about really the, the big picture, why we're excited about the asset class because of certain growth metrics. And then Mark will take you through why indices and mutual funds have underperformed and, and our performance record over the last, you know, real, since the inception of our portfolio, which was 
uh, three plus years ago. Let's see now. Oh, where have I put the clicker? Here it is. So this is Mark CV, and he'll be speaking in a couple minutes. Okay. So um, let's really talk about uh, what is this? What, what is this? Uh, this emerging market that we're talking about, and why you should be ex have some exposure to the to to companies that operate in this in these areas. First of all, the emerging markets are home to over six billion people, and that that's currently 86 percent of the world's population. But more importantly, almost, uh, the median age of the of this emerging market group is 28.4 percent which I think they make up something like 90% of the world's, let's see, it's 90% of the world's population under 30. Now think about that. 90% of the world's population under 30 live in these markets. And as you'll see, it is really young people and as they kind of grow through their, their, you know, their earnings uh, cycle, that they, if they're lucky enough to kind of uh, gain uh, uh, middle class status and begin to earn money. They begin to have disposable income. They think about their children. They spend on education, health care, motorcycles, televisions. Really, that's what companies that are in those markets, that's what they're looking at. And that's, what, that's the opportunity that they're looking at. Uh, you know, in, I guess in, in uh, 2012, China became clearly the, the world's second largest economy, and really some people, by some me metrics, it is now the world's largest economy. Um, and if you think about that, China is now, and India, and Indonesia, these are huge markets now for a lot of the goods that, that you know, we all here take for granted. Uh, China is the largest market for uh, cell phone users today. India is number two, Indonesia is number six, and China is the world's largest market for smartphones. Uh, and this really has, you know, this dispersion of technology is, is quite interesting as well. As, as you see countries like Indonesia, they're going from really having no phone immediately to mobile phones, and now a growing smartphone market as well. And so that actually, uh, for example, creates demand for cell phone towers. And so in the past, we have owned very, very profitable, and we actually still own one today, uh, uh, Indonesian companies that, sim that simply are putting up and owning cell phone towers because of the increased demand for uh, cell phone towers because of smartphones. Uh, Now, this, this kind of just underscores this, this, the, the population uh, fact that, I, was, that I, I, I told you about. Obviously, China and India are very large, uh, uh, heavily populated countries, and China is the world's largest, but, but given growth you know, dynamics, India will overtake China as the world's largest uh, country probably within the next 10 years. Uh, but I also want, I just want to point out this group of countries uh, under this Southeast Asia. If you look from kind of the Philippines over to Indonesia, that's uh, the ASEAN 10. And there are you know, 525 million people in that group of countries. And as an economic bloc, that's really the world's third largest economic entity. And so a lot of the, the, the companies that we look at, they understand that. And there is a lot of trade that goes between China and ASEAN. Oops, I think I clicked again. Uh, and so on. So, you know, we really see tremendous opportunities. And, be, and you'll see later on when Mark t takes you through the portfolio, we have significant economic exposure to companies in India, China, and also the ASEAN 10. On the other hand, um, you look at uh, Sub Saharan Africa. And uh, you'll see large population. But for the present time, we, we, we think that most of it is uh, uninvestable. 
And in fact, uh, our exposure to, to Africa is primarily through very well-managed, very profitable companies in South Africa. Uh, I've traveled a lot to South Africa, and I've been management over 15 years, and um, they really have a number of companies that really understand the dynamics of that country and how to service really key sectors. Uh, and one of our investments is a global leader in micro lending, and they've really made capital available to really the largest part of the of the African population, uh, the South African population. Very profitable, you know, very well managed, uh, but really, you know, uh, it'll be for it'll, it'll be a while before we we probably. You know, we look every every day for companies in Africa, but right now our, our exposure is limited to, to South Africa. <clears throat> now, sometimes uh, we are asked, and I am asked often, um, probably more often in the past, uh, David, why should I take the risk of investing in a company that is operating in these uh, in different countries when I, I can really get exposure to emerging markets by owning the, you know, by owning American companies, you know, think of Coca-Cola, McDonald's, uh, Pepsi, Starbucks. Um, why should I take the risk of, you know, your your portfolio when I can I can get exposure to emerging markets through these companies? Well, really, the key here is that um, you saw really uh, Rob talking about kind of the the lack of growth in a lot of American companies. And I can tell you that actually extends to even these global companies, is that even though you know, they do have exposure, they actually, as an entity, as a company, are growing much slower than the, the, the smaller local companies are really in, you know, live in the neighborhoods and really exploiting opportunities. This is a, is a bit of a, a busy chart. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go through pretty quickly because the message is pretty simple. This really is, is showing you the differential growth rate of emerging market companies, those companies that really operate locally compared to developed market companies also uh, operating those markets. And it's looking actually at the growth in their own home markets for the emerging market companies that is their, their particular domestic market, same with the developed market companies, and it compares that growth rate and looks at the growth rate they have in other developed markets. And then finally, the growth that everybody has in the emerging markets. Uh, now, what you can see here pretty clearly is that there is higher overall growth from emerging market companies versus developed market companies. And in this chart, it's you know, 24 versus 10. But, you know, those names I just mentioned, I just actually took a look recently at kind of the first quarter reports from a lot of these, you know, really well-known and really well-managed conglomerates. So, Coke, it looks like they're kind of their first quarter numbers in 2015, it looks like. They're, they're projecting 1% to 3% revenue growth. PepsiCo, minus 3%. McDonald's, they're having a tough time. They're, they're down about 11%. They're having a fall of 30% in EPS year over year, and a, and a big part of that is the, the negative impact of currency translation. Uh, Procter & Gamble is a company I consider an outstanding company. Uh, they're looking at 5% uh, global sales decline, and a lot of that is, again, due to the negative impact of a strong dollar on those operations. Uh, uh, Starbucks have, actually still is growing pretty pretty nicely. It's growing at about 15 percent. So here are companies with significant exposure to uh, the emerging markets, but in fact, uh, at least uh, for the last couple of years, this this really strong dollars has actually hurt them. And if you compare that to kind of the growth rates that that you see in this chart, but re really more importantly, what I can show you in our portfolio. Really, the growth rate is very dynamic, and most importantly, um, we were able to find, uh, because of the risk associated with investing in emerging markets by most investors, combined with our ability to really look and identify, you know, small to medium-sized companies that, quite frankly, when I was at, at uh, T. Rowe Price, I, I couldn't invest in. They were just simply too small. 
when you're managing $50 billion and try to put that to work, that really means that, you know, that you know, the average market cap of a company I can invest in is more like $40 billion. So you'll see the companies that we invest in, I believe, kind of average over the portfolio closer to $1 billion. Uh, now, uh, you know, why, why are these local companies able to grow you know, so much more rapidly? It really is simply that they understand their customer needs and desires, and they are very focused and very targeted in how they meet them. Um, and in some cases, it's just that locals prefer uh, a local name. You know, I, I brought up the example of Proctors and Gamble, <coughs> P&G. P&G is a great company. P&G went into the Korean market about uh, 12 years ago, and uh, they, they had hired a young Korean man who, who uh, had gone to school in the U.S. It took his uh, undergrad and MBA from Cornell. You know, very smart guy. He joined P&G, uh, Procter & Gamble's in Korea, was their CEO for a couple of years. And uh, then about seven years ago, he left them and joined a, a uh, Korean local company, uh, LG Household. And um, since that time, <coughs> Procter & Gamble's has really essentially been flat to negative in Korea, where LG Households has been growing their sales at 25% per annum over the last five years, and their profits are 30%, which is a, you know. And so, the, um, at least in that market, that is an example that I, you know, and it's I, I go to Korea every year because my wife is Korean. I've seen over my, even during my period, the time where I would go into the stores and I would see a Procter & Gamble products to now where you can't find them. I mean, this really, you know, they have just been outmaneuvered. And even more recently, Starbucks, which uh, started in Korea in, in 1999, it was, really, it was really the first big franchiser in Korea. Um, now the, 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 the local Korean, I, you know, the local Korean houses are pro proliferating. Uh, there's a maybe a company that maybe you've all heard of, Bene, Bene Cafe. Now they're extending out here in the U.S. But what I find is that you know, you know that Bene Cafe really grew quite rapidly because I understood the local taste. They were offering uh, kind of garlic cinnamon toast and other things you never find anywhere else in the world. And uh, you know if you know Koreans, that's uh, and they like that. And even more recently, I went back there, and there is a shaved ice dessert that they serve now in another chain of, of Korean coffee stores. And again, you know, and, 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 and multinational is going to be really hard pressed and have that as part of their normal menu. And that really has led to just an explosion of really interesting uh, coffee houses, coffee house experiences in, in Korea. So if you ever get out to Korea, I really uh, think I'd recommend you all go to a different, just go to different Korean coffee houses for a really wonderful experience. And I don't know if you remember that great Korean um, pop tune, uh, Kangnam style, that was a couple years ago, Sai. Well, you know, Kang, that, that song is really about a, a young woman in Korea and how she's, she overspends in, uh, in coffee houses and, and, she's actually, and, and she's just a, an office girl. And you know, Korean uh, research will show you that something like 85% of, of, of coffee cafe um, uh, uh, customers are w young women. So again, that's something that the Korean companies understand. They target it, and they grow, you know, grow, grow very successful. <coughs> Let's see, where are we now? Uh, I think we're going to skip over in for a bit of time. To find out, so it's one thing to really have large uh, population growing and a young population, but the exciting part of that really is that that translates to, to a massive growing emerging consumer class. And so really the idea is this. You know, around the emerging markets we see that the, the, key, the key level here to hit is about uh, three and a half thousand dollars per person GDP, and so that means a household of about you know ten to twelve thousand dollars per annum. And what you see at that kind of level, when people get to that earnings level, they begin to to have enough to you know to buy cars and or scooters and 
and you know, and, and think about travel and, and so on. And what you're really seeing in the emerging markets is really this explosion of this consumer class. And you can see that uh, you know, in 15 years' time, you know, we estimate that over 60% of the 1 billion households that really kind of are in this upper echelon of this consumer class, they're going to reside in, in the developing world. Now, a lot of that is actually going to be focused in cities. And, and urbanization is, is one of these concepts that go hand in hand with this idea of, of a growing consumer class. This chart you know, kind of showed you quite you know, simply here that if you look at global GDP in the year 2010, about 38% uh, of it was really uh, you know, reside, you know, resided in emerging market cities or 18% emerging market cities and kind of the, the, the total of 38% in, in, in uh, you know, kind of all cities uh, in the developing area where as you can see that essentially over the 2010 to, 19, to 2025, the largest cities in the emerging markets are gonna represent 47% of global GDP. So that really means what's happening in the, in the really in the world is this movement from, you know, kind of the rural existence to urban existence. And again, in my lifetime, the greatest example of that is China. And, it, and that's, you know, when I first went, you know, I, I'm actually born in the United States, so my first trip to China was in 1966. It kind of piped <coughs> the, the uh, cultural revolution. Uh, in China, a terrible time. It really set them back. You know, they lost 10 years, and, and probably more than that. But you know, for me in my lifetime to see kind of that, you know, that country and that uh, very rural-based uh, economy kind of grow into this economic uh, industrial powerhouse is really staggering. And I think what you're really going to see in places like Indonesia and India, this is going to happen again. And it's going to be real exciting for you as an investor to be invested in the best companies in these, these areas that can take advantage of that process. Because clearly the best companies understand that. In our portfolio, you'll see very few conglomerates. You'll, you mainly see single, you know, kind of single business, you know, operations. And they're focused on selling drugs or selling um, uh, mappies or, or formula and so on. Um, and really, I guess that, that kind of makes it easier for us to assess risk and kind of figure out what these companies really do. Uh, this chart really begins to look at that, that income growth in, in a specific case. If you again look at China, in the year 2000, you had about 1% of people who were in an income level as, a, as households in the mainstream and affluent level. But by 2010, that had grown to eight. But more importantly, as I was talking about the consumer class, 82% of that, of that Chinese, of Chinese households, they be, they're beginning to be in that, at least that consumer class. And by 2020, you see the group of mainstream and affluent in China is really going to jump to over 50% of the population. So right now, China is the world's most exciting market for anybody selling luxury goods. Now, you know, everybody knows that. And uh, again, that's, uh, that is something that, uh, even though our portfolio doesn't really kind of you know, target that kind of thing, we just happen to find companies that, that do benefit from that, from that trend. Uh, so this again, this is just a, a repeat a bit of that consumer class idea. So as we turn next to the returns for emerging markets, I want to introduce our <coughs> partner, uh, Mark Painter. We'll take you through uh, that. I think maybe Bill will have a more extended introduction. Yeah, let me give it. Thank you, David. Sure. All right, so it's 2004. We just hired Brad. He's building a system that screens the entire globe. And uh, 
uh, we said, you know, this is working pretty good. Let's go back to Carnegie Mellon and see if we can get any other tech-savvy kids. So uh, we went back and uh, I told the placement office, I want to I want to interview any computer science, information technology person that you have that I can persuade to not go teach or go work for Google or Facebook and that might want to become a portfolio manager. So they introduced me to Mark Painter, who was just on the verge of taking a job uh, with IBM, who had dual degrees in information technology and business. Uh, we explained to Mark that we thought his combination of business and technology skills would make him a great, provide a great foundation for being a money manager. And at least that time, I was right on. Uh, Mark joined the firm in 2004 and has worked along with Brad developing the, and implementing AdStar, the AdStar investment process, and applying it to the real world business of managing portfolios and other people's money. And additionally, Mark oversaw the development of the processes that we use to buy and sell stocks in the markets that David was just talking about, Malaysia, Peru, Turkey, India, where we buy stocks in local currencies, on local exchanges, on a daily basis. Um, that requires an understanding. These markets are driven by different things than the NYSE or NASDAQ. Mark oversaw that entire process with that. Additionally, Mark runs SEL Capital, which is our institutional group, which is an advisor to uh, uh, publicly traded mutual funds and also advises institutions, which sometimes have uh, different time, or which most times have different time horizons and mandates than individuals. Over the last 11 years with the firm, Mark has earned multiple performance awards against some of the best in class managers in the world. Mark Painter. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate the introduction. And uh, just for everybody to know, we are uh, we're getting to the home stretch. I guess this would be considered the seventh inning. And lucky for you, we're in Philadelphia and not a Chicago Cubs game. So I will not be singing, take me out to the ball game. <laughs> So let's start here with, uh, David did a good job of giving the overall fundamental backdrop of the emerging markets and what we think can be a uh, good long-term return that you can see in the emerging markets. But before we go into our portfolio composition, I'd like to take a look at what the emerging markets, the indices have done over the last four years. As you can see, this chart here really portrays the last four and a half, five years, basically from 2010 to, to the end of the fourth, first quarter of 2015. This blue line represents the S&P 500. And clustered down here is China, the emerging markets, Brazil, and Russia. So if you break out these returns from 2010, you've got the S&P 500, which is about up 70%. You've got China, which is the green line here, which is up about 20%, and most of those returns actually came within the last couple months. Then you have emerging markets as a whole, which is down 10%. The purple line, which is Brazil, which is down 20%. And the blue line here, which is Russia, which is down over 40%. So if you have all these fundamental drivers, if you take, take a step back and you listen to what Rob was talking about, you listen to what Brad was talking about, about how what the drivers are of return in the stock market. It's basically the underlying companies and the fundamentals. So if you take the first derivative of that, or really the first derivative of GDP growth, that's what drives company earnings. So if you've got GDP growth here in the United States, which has been around 2%, and you've got returns that are 70%, and you have index returns in the emerging markets with double the GDP to growth, something must be missing. And that takes us to this next slide, which really is about index construction. In our view, the index construction, especially in the emerging markets, is flawed. So let's take a step back and talk about the last emerging markets bull cycle, which really was in the early 2000s, really up to the Great Recession of 2008. The main driver of those returns was a lot of government spending from China. They were pumping a lot of money into infrastructure, into construction, uh, into a lot of spending. So they were spending a lot of money in uh, commodities, building them up. Then the Great Recession happened and things changed. Now what that does is that gets us to, where does that put us today? And where does that put us today? And if you look at that, and David did a good job of portraying the strong fundamentals of the consumer class. But if you think about China and the government, 
and where they are and what they're trying to do, which is move away from being an investment-based economy, one that focuses on infrastructure and spending, to a consumer-based economy, one that's more similar to the United States, that's where the growth is going to be. And that's something that, you know, Brad touched on it earlier. That's something that everybody can see. It's very, very logical. But when you look at the index construction, which is this chart all the way to the left, you can see that the emerging markets, the red bar, 15.4% is in energy and commodity related stocks in the emerging markets. Now, that compares to the S&P 500, which is less than 10%. Again, a consumer driven economy. So if the future growth is going to be in the consumer class, why would you want to be like the big hedge funds and institutional investors and invest close to the index? And why not go where the growth is? So as you can see here, our exposure is 5.8% versus the index, which is 15.4. That takes us to this middle bar here, which is the allocation of state-owned enterprises in the emerging markets, which is in red, around 30% versus our portfolio, which is 0% in state-owned enterprises. Now, this is something in the emerging markets uh, that is pretty prevalent, obviously 30% of the, 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 the companies. Now, this is going to be different companies like a Petrobras in Brazil, a Rosneft in Russia, a Sinook in China. Now, in the previous bull cycle, back in the early 2000s, this was the best place to be because these were the biggest companies. Many people thought they were safe because they were backed by the government. Now, the problem with that is that these companies, when you break it down, are very, very inefficient. And it's not just the emerging markets where state-owned enterprises are inefficient. Just go back to 2008, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, two state-owned enterprises here in the United States, which absolutely collapsed. So state-owned enterprises, and again, if you go back to Brad's presentation, when we go through and we're looking at return on invested capital versus the cost of capital, and we're looking for those excellent companies, Stay-on enterprises are not run as well, which is why you will see that us, for our portfolio, we have 0%. <clears throat> and then the last part of this slide here is really the, a cap weighting. So the emerging markets has small cap weighting of less than 1%. Our portfolio is 84.5%. Now David talked and he gave a little bit of an example on LG Household versus Procter & Gamble and the trouble that multinationals are having versus local companies. And what happens is, and that really leads us to what we feel is, is an investable theme for the future and what we think could be the next emerging markets super cycle, which is where the most attractive opportunities are. And for us, the most attractive opportunities in emerging markets is the small cap companies. It's the local companies, the family owned businesses that understand the consumer that can take advantage and generate high returns on invested capital. You're not going to get that from the big multinational companies. Another thing that we noticed is that if the, in most cases, the big hedge funds, the big mutual funds, so if you as an investor want to go out and invest in that particular theme and you're going to, you're going to buy into a mutual fund, you're going to get that 16% exposure to commodities. You're going to get almost 100% exposure to the big multinational names. In fact, what we noticed is when we took a look at our actual holdings and ran through the underlying holders of those, we found that actually 85% of our holdings, there is not one single U.S. hedge fund or institutional investor that makes up the top five holders. 85% of our companies. So even the ones, even the funds that are able to buy the stocks that we're investing in, the ones that have that type of growth, they're such a small portion of that mutual fund. They're making up less than half of 1%. So the contribution to performance is going to be immaterial. So let's talk a little bit about our investment philosophy in the emerging markets. What we do is we search for high growth companies that are too small for mutual funds and institutional investors. That's the first. But number two, and I think this is important, ones that have high levels of insider and local ownership. I'm going to go to a chart in a minute that compares our portfolio versus the S&P 500 and then also the Emerging Markets Index. But when you're talking about insider ownership with these small companies, a lot of times these are the founding family members. 
They're the ones that started the business. They're the ones that continue to own the business. So why is this a good thing? The reason why it's a good thing is because the owners, because they own so much of the underlying shares, are aligned with the shareholders, which is us, which is you, the investor. And what does that mean? They're not investing everybody else's money. They're investing their own money. So they're not going to do pet projects. They're not going to do a lot of risky bets with their, with their capital allocations. And additionally, if they have capital left over, they're going to pay themselves back. So you'll see higher dividend bids. Next, we want to identify companies that create shareholder value and are undervalued. I'm not going to go through this. Brad did a fantastic job earlier walking you through what we look for in companies. But the last part, and I think this is pretty important, is what we aim to produce, which is an active return through stock selection, but also to have a lower risk than the benchmark. So a couple of statistics that I think are, are, are pretty fascinating. If you look at our alpha, so when we did our most recent factor model to test our portfolio versus the benchmark, we found that actually 90% of our alpha, which is the return that can be attributable to us as managers, not just taking market risk, 90% of that return was actually attributable to stock selection. Additionally, our beta, or the volatility, how much our portfolio moves relative to the benchmark is 0.68. So what does that mean? That means we're about 32% less risky than the overall market. So now here's a, here, here's a chart that really compares our portfolio relative to the S&P 500 and the emerging markets. The first one here is market cap. I talked about that. We're about 1 billion versus around 37 billion for both the S&P 500 and the emerging markets. But next, the closely held shares Again, we want to be aligned with the, with, with the owners of the company. We're at 61%. The S&P 500, only 4%. Only 4% inside ownership. And the emerging market index is 42%. So we're higher than the emerging market index. But the interesting thing about that, and this is actually under-reporting, because that 42% inside ownership, as I mentioned earlier, 30% of the emerging markets is state-owned enterprises. So that there's a portion of that in that 42% that's owned by the government, not the family members. Next, we'll focus on dividend yield. Our dividend yield is 2.6% um, versus 2.2, 2.5. Again, not, not outrageous, not something huge, but again, we're, vo we're focusing on growth companies. As, now, the more important thing, as opposed to just the regular dividend yield, is that dividend payout ratio. Brad talked about it earlier. Rob talked about it as about the intrinsic value, about how you, can, how you can continue to grow that dividend, and that will be accretive to shareholders. Now, if you look here, our dividend payout ratio is only 27% versus 44% for the S&P 500 and 37% for the Emerging Markets Index. So not only are we paying a higher dividend yield, but we're paying less of our earnings out. And what does that mean? That means we're investing more back into the company for growth prospects, and we're still paying it out, and we have the opportunity to not only sustain the current dividend, but to have future growth in that dividend going forward. A couple more that I want to focus on, uh, you know, the return on capital, obviously that's been a theme throughout the day, 26% versus 16 for both the S&P and the emerging markets. Also, as Brad mentioned, cash flow growth. Cash flow is very, very important to us um, as opposed to just regular um, earnings account. 30% versus 10% for the S&P and 16% for the emerging markets. The last piece here that I, I really want to focus on is the P-E ratio. And that's the valuation. So for every dollar of earnings you have, this is how much. So for our portfolio, nine times. So every dollar of earnings you're paying nine times for, for, for that stream of earnings. The S&P is 16 and a half. The emerging markets, 14.3. Now, what does that mean? If you go back to what Brad's presentation was talking about, and he was talking about Charlie Munger, and he was talking about Berkshire Hathaway. Those companies that are generating excellent returns on capitals, you have great companies, and you can pay a fair price and you will do better. But this, this right here, which is very, very rare, is investment nirvana. Because not only are you investing in companies that are generating cash flow growth, that's three times the S&P 500, earnings growth, that's seven times the S&P 500, but you're paying almost half the multiple. 
So not only are you buying great companies, but you're paying a discount. Investment nirvana. So now I'll just take a, a, a quick look at how our portfolio is positioned. As you can see, we're pretty diversified across uh, many different countries. But there's something in here that I think is, is, is significant and really stands out. If you take a look, India and China make up almost 40% of our portfolio. If you go back to David's second slide, which the one that focused on global population, what stood out? The fact that India and China were the largest populations in the world. So it's no coincidence that as we're looking for companies, we're finding ones that are absolutely fantastic in India and China because that's where the real growth is. That's where the emerging middle class is. That's where global population growth is. So that's where we want to focus. That's the most logical place to be. So we talked a bit about how we're, how we're constructed, a little bit of background on the emerging markets. But really, where does that lead us? What does that lend us to? How does that actually look in practice? So here's our return since inception, which is 2012. I hope you like the Christmas motif, the red and green. Um, we're the green, the emerging markets ETF is the red. And you can see pretty clearly in every single year we've outperformed the benchmark. In particular, in 2013, we had a negative return in the emerging markets. We were positive 3%. 2014, negative return for the emerging markets. We were up 11.2%. And then the most intriguing part of this is the fact that you're starting to see finally, finally a rally in the emerging markets, up 9% so far in 2015, and we're still participating and outperforming on the upside. Again, because we own great companies, we're buying them at cheap valuations, and we're holding them for the long term. And to illustrate this point a little bit further, I'm going to bring David back up here to walk you through a company that he recently visited to show the uniqueness of our portfolio and how we think that we fit perfectly for the next investment super cycle in emerging markets. Instead. <coughs> Instead. Yeah, I actually, uh, last week I met with uh, <coughs> management of Gen 10 Pharmaceutical, a company that we we looked at and studied for a long time. We made a we, we made an investment, I think, in, in August, market it was August of, of last year. So what we like about Gen 10, we've actually been focused on, uh, on, uh, on a couple of companies that we discovered in our portfolio that were going very rapidly. And uh, we're operating in the, the Chinese healthcare area, and then we you know we saw these companies that were, were achieving very high rates of return, and so you know they, they passed our our model screen, so we started to take a deeper dive and find out you know why they were successful. So clearly, uh, the the healthcare um, uh, sector in China is is very interesting. You have a very large population. Unlike India, for example, which is still young, it's the China is actually experiencing an, an aging population, and with that is coming some. And because of the, the years of deprivation, you know, terrible health uh, problems for the for the Chinese population. The government understands this, and they've really started putting in place programs to address this. They have now a, a national health scheme, and and drugs are covered, and uh, even though it covers a, a wide you know, percentage of the population, the per capita spend still is minute compared to developed world, in particular the, the U.S., but it still, still means that there's a great opportunity for, initially, <coughs> Chinese drug makers. So uh, it's, at one point, our screens had popped uh, four different drug companies, all growing very rapidly, and uh, we went to visit them all, you know, good, you know, good management. Some were very open to talking with me, some really had no time really. I mean, they, they, they understood that I, wa I wanted to see them, but they are just, they were too focused. And so I had to figure out other ways to, to get to whether or not these were real stories. And so we checked the stores and we had our you know, investment bankers and analysts that I know and trust go out there and see for themselves. And so everything checked out. Uh, and we really made some great gains in those, but uh, we've actually uh, 
divested in two of them because we had made great profits, but also importantly, there have been some changes coming in on how the Chinese are addressing the high cost of drugs. So up to quite recently, only hospitals were really the kind of, you know, were responsible for 90, 95% of drug sales. And they, and they began to, to operate with cartel-like pricing and the government understood this. And so they've really encouraged now um, the growth of, of the drug stores to be the, you know, the primary distributors of drugs. And one of those happened to be Gen 10 Pharmaceutical. So Gen 10 was started by an, a young entrepreneur about, I guess he, he started his, uh, his first store in 1998 with his partner and a dog. So it was two men and a dog. And really, it's literally, they told me that, you know, they had one pharmaceutical store in Northeast China, and every night, the man and the dog, one man and, and the dog, the dog had to be there every night, but they traded off, slept overnight in their store. Now, today, what is that, uh, 17 years later, they have 953 uh, self-operating uh, pharmaceutical drug stores in, nor in really primarily northeast of China. And uh, they were helped along by um, uh, three international venture capital or private equity firms. Uh, they, went, they went public a couple of years ago. And uh, the, uh, the, the venture capitals of uh, private equity guys have, have, have uh, you know, uh, exited the, the, the stock. Uh, the CEO, uh, as you can see, 51% are closely held and consistent with our theme. Uh, the, the CEO actually owns about 49% of it, and he, he, he personally bought out the last uh, private equity firm about a month and a half ago. He bought, uh, and he topped up his shares, another uh, uh, 10 million U.S. Uh, we like that. It shows confidence in the company. Again, if you look at the metrics of this, uh, as you can see, you know, again, very consistent with our portfolio matri uh, uh, metrics. His five-year sales growth has been right around 36%, profit growth even above that. Management's giving me guidance that uh, it'll be, you know, those numbers, they will exceed 25% on both of those profit and sales. And I think they're understating because no analyst yet is, has been able to um, get a handle on what their new um, Joint, they basically they have a, uh, a working relationship with Alibaba, which is the Amazon of, of China. So they really are going with uh, uh, they're uh, going forward very rapidly on online distribution of drugs. It's really supported by the government. The government is very interested in bringing down drug costs to the Chinese population. Alibaba is very connected, and those numbers nothing is baked into that 25 percent forward growth rate. But even if it is only 25% growth, we're still okay with it because right now we're only paying about nine times for that, that, that growth rate. Um, they have a modest dividend yield of 1.6%, uh, and, and they are a, a net cash company, and the return on, that, the return on, on invested capital is uh, approximately 20%. And cost of capital, we estimate, and they, again, they have uh, no debt, but so their, their cost of capital is around 7%. So these are the, what we look for, a company that is consistently earning three times its cost of capital. We know the entrepreneur, he's driven. Uh, he thinks uh, he's, gonna, he's gonna become the next CVS. Um, and we hope to be along for the ride. In your booklets, you have another, you know, we weren't, uh, we, we don't have to, we're not trying to hide anything. I think you have about 20, companies that we currently own. You have another five companies that we've sold. Give you an idea that we do sell when, when things become expensive. Um, that really concludes our formal part of the presentation. Uh, Mark, Brad, and I would just love to entertain any questions you have about what we do. We're very excited about you know, the, what we're doing in the international opportunities as well as the other portfolios. And please stick around, have a drink with us, have dinner with us, and uh, you know, let's, let's get to know you better. Thank you.